The first question that I ask everyone is, can you please introduce yourself? Yes. Nice. Uh, my name is Rami Nusser. I'm the marketing director for Ululab. We make math games for kids. Fantastic. And how long have you been doing that for? Uh, I started in October 2020. So that would be two years and a bit, two years, two months. And were you there at the start of the company or the company itself is longer than that? No, Ululab has been around for over 10 years. Uh, they're very well known, or I guess we're well known for the Slice Fraction series of games, yeah. which came out in 2014, which um, I mean, worldwide was very successful, but in Quebec especially is super well known. So I, I constantly, when I tell people I work for Ululab, they're like, that sounds familiar. I say, mm -hmm. yeah, you know, we do, we make a game called Math Makers. They did Slice Fraction, like, oh yeah, the Fractions game with the Mammoth. Yeah, and, and everyone, any teacher I meet, yeah. any educator, they all know about it. And even people who are in, on the peripheries of that industry know about it. So it's, yeah. it's, a, it's a great place to be in terms of um, getting recognized. So well, and let's talk about a little bit about like recognition in the industry, because one mm -hmm. of the things we were talking about in earlier panels was that like part of the problem of like someone who wants to make an educational game is visibility, visibility. And it yeah. sounds like you have a bit established that for yourself. But is that something that is like really challenging to get to? Absolutely. Uh, so we have visibility in terms of slice fractions in Quebec and the rest of Canada a little bit, but not that much. And then there are a couple of markets where slice fractions really penetrated well, like Japan. So mm -hmm. there's a lot of recognition for, I believe in Japan, it's called slice mammoth. Okay. Yeah. You know, because Japanese, they have like a uh, different uh, criteria for what's exciting for them. Right. Yeah. I mean, mammoths are exciting. Right. Yeah. Uh, so, um, what was the question again? It was visibility, visibility, right? <laughs> so, there's some visibility that comes with being associated with slice fractions, but in terms of um, visibility for the new game, it's very different. Slice fractions is kind of uh, magical in that it came out at a time when there was nothing quite like it on the market. Okay. But since then, the app market has been saturated with educational games or educational games that claim to be educational yeah. but aren't necessarily. And so it makes it much harder to get visibility nowadays. Uh, even being featured on the app store, uh, you know, 10 years ago meant you're making a million sales, but now yeah. being featured is a thing that happens all the time for everyone, right? So it doesn't translate into the same level of like clicks and not at all. So what, what are the things that people can do to try to make their products visible? Like what are the options available to educational game makers? Uh, that's a very good question. It, it's, it's the, the marketing question, right? It's like, uh, and it all depends on what your budget is and how much time and your resources. So if you've got a lot of budget and a lot of and a few resources, ads mm -hmm. is a really good way to get people's eyes on your product. Uh, if you have not a lot of budget, but time, then uh, the, the dual mix of social media plus uh, traditional media is a good way to go. Uh, we did a media push um, in September, I believe, or August, September for math makers to talk about mm -hmm. how the game is free in Quebec. Uh, okay. So well, the game is free worldwide for uh, schools and school teachers, uh, but we, planned the campaign to be just for Quebec. And off that one campaign, we got, I think, five or 600 teachers to sign up. And, oh, wow. and try. Yeah, it was very surprising. So the game is free, but you're still a company that in some capacity is making money, I'm assuming. So right. where is that profit coming from? Right, sorry, that, that's, that's a miss, a miss uh, speak on my part. The game is free for schools and school teachers and educators. But okay. parents who buy the game for their kids pay for the game. For the so game. if you're a teacher and you're teaching at you know the local school here and you're teaching second and third grade, uh, you can sign up for a free account and you can give a free account to all of your students in your classroom. Uh, but if those students want to play at home, they have to get their own accounts and they pay for those basically. So essentially parents are funding the game for schools. Okay, that's yeah. really interesting. And yeah. that model has been relatively successful for you all. So far so good, yeah. It, it, the, the interesting thing is it gets a lot of eyes on our product yeah. in a way uh, that you know it would be hard to get otherwise. Um, and so far, I, d I don't want to say it has translated into a lot of sales because I can't track that of quite course. yet. Of course, that's almost impossible. Right, yeah. but um, I am working on something where we would give the teachers coupons and they could hand those out to the parents of the kids. And right. then if the kids, if the parents sign up with one of those coupons, they get a discount and that right. lets us track also. But that's still in the, in the works. In the so works. I, I don't have a, yeah. I don't have data yet. Well, because I, so people who are not in this space um, as much as you and I, and I would say you're in this space more than I, um, have been to me. Oh, you you want to make educational games? Well, that must be really profitable. And then most people <laughs> I talk to in the space are like they laugh at that question mm -hmm. as you just did. And so what what is the problem of like why do people think it's profitable? Why is it not nearly as profitable as people think? Right, that's a really good question. Uh, so. 
people think it's profitable because you think like kids play games and so educational games kids you know would be the thing to get kids attention and to get mm -hmm. them playing and to get them learning right yeah. but the problem is kids don't buy the games it's parents and so you have to convince parents who aren't necessarily buyers of video games that this is the game they need to buy for their kid right Whereas uh, if it, you know we're talking about something like Minecraft or some other game, yeah. uh, the kid will see the game and the kid will convince their parent to give them that game, right? Right. So in this situation, uh, the kid is the, the one that's sort of pushing for the product and the parents are like, ah, all right, fine, I'll get it for you. But kids don't necessarily push for educational games. <laughs> Why would a kid push for like a math game when the kid can go for, I don't know, Gran Turismo or something? Right? Yeah. So that's, that's really where the big problem is. And, and the disconnect is also, Say you convince the parent to get the game, mm -hmm. the parent needs to try the game and see if they like it. But in order to do so, they need to have their kid there at the same time. So you're asking the parent right. to one, be convinced to get the game, two, try it with their kid and see if their kid likes the game, and then finally purchase the game after the fact. So I'm assuming you're thinking about that relationship from a marketing perspective. Like is mm -hmm. the game being designed in a way that it appeals less to the eyes of a child and more to the eyes of a parent? There are some games that are designed like that. Uh, with Math Makers and Slice Fractions, we decided to go for something that's purely pleasurable to the child, like happy, fun, yeah. intrinsic, like I want to I want to play this, right? <laughs> what that has translated into, though, as a consequence, is that kids will see the game and think, oh, a puzzle game, rad, and they'll play. Parents see the game and think, this is just a puzzle game. No, I need right. something that teaches my kids math. I want my kids to learn timetables. and they don't necessarily see the value in a, a game that actually plays like a game. They want something more like, I don't know, you're a dragon slayer and you s slam your sword into a dragon as your sword hits, two plus three appears on the screen. You know? <laughs> yeah, the, the beautiful classic gamified <laughs> right? fantasy realm game. Yeah. yeah. So we have, it, we're, we're going with game-based learning as opposed to gamification. And so it's better for the kids, but harder to convince the parents. Yeah. I mean, I know we're going to talk about those two themes a little bit later. I mean, I'm personally a large fan and proponent of game-based learning, but it sounds like what you're saying is it's harder to sell that. Yes. Uh, so the, our struggle over the past year has really been making the math explicit to the parent in our marketing materials mm -hmm. while retaining the magic of the game and the gaming for the child. And so we're not modifying the game itself because we like the game. We're right. modifying our marketing to show the parents here's where the math is. That's really interesting. Yeah. I, I really actually like you putting it that way too because it's something that, I mean, the marketing side of things, there's not a lot of discussion happening in my academic space is on. So it's really nice to hear it from, from your perspective there. And so is it just math makers and slice fractions? Are there other things that you're thinking of producing or other needs and gaps that you want to create games for? Uh, I'm working on other games that are unrelated to education. Okay. Uh, the stuff that's in the education space, it's really just the stuff at Ulu Lab and it's uh, math makers and slice fractions one and two. Uh, the thing is we don't really support slice fractions one and two anymore because they're in math makers. Right. So when you get math makers, you have, you know, fractions and advanced fractions and addition, et cetera, et cetera. Mm -hmm. uh, and yeah, that's that's really all we're focused on. Like that's that's Ulu Lab's thing for the next few years is math makers. No, I love that. And so if you I don't know if you know, because I know you weren't there at the inception of the company, but was like it always driven by the fact of making a game based learning math game? Was that like core identity number one for Ulu Lab or was there other kind of like mission goals in the works? Uh, yeah, I can actually answer that question. Uh, so Francois uh, boucher Jeunesse, who's the one of the one of the co-founders, um, what happened was he worked on Halo 3, I believe, in okay. 2008. Yeah, and he did a lot of time on that game, and he was very proud of the work they did. And he saw the impact that it had, that it reached millions and millions of people. Mm -hmm. And he was like, this is very cool, but I would like to have an impact on the world that is measurable and not just, you know, just fun. He wanted to have some kind of impact. And he wasn't sure if he wanted it to be uh, environmental or political or educational. He wasn't sure. He just wanted a measurable impact that he right. could see. And after thinking about it for a while, he decided education is where he wanted to go. So he went and he got a master's in education. And okay. then he came back to the games industry and co-founded Ululab. And that's when they started working on math makers. So his goal from the get-go was to make an educational game when the company right. was founded. That's really interesting. I really like you putting it that way. Um, and so we are running to the end of our time. And so I want to just ask you, because um, you said that you had some scathing thoughts about the industry. Are there any that you would <laughs> like to share? Sure. Yeah, I'll share one, which is that um, it's an industry where I want to say like 80% of the educational games are garbage. And it's sad <laughs> yeah. to say it because they're, they're like they're pure gamification with no 
uh, intrinsic value for the player to want to play, right? It's just like either they give you rewards to play or they just appeal to the parents, where it's, it's a thinly veiled, you know, math problems or spelling problems yeah. wrapped in a, a sugar coated game like thing, which isn't really a yeah, game. Yeah, chocolate right? covered broccoli. Yeah, yeah. exactly. Um, but there are, uh, I want to say, 20% of companies that are just pure magic. And you know, uh, I can name a couple like CodeSpark, I think does mm -hmm. exceptional work. Papamba does like a beautiful looking game. Uh, MathMakers, of course, I love our game. I mean, you gotta, you gotta plug it, of course. Please. You know, uh, but so there's like, if you, if you get on the app store and just look for educational games, most of what you'll find will just suck and it'll be very sad. But if you can dig through to find the, the gold nuggets, there are some and they are exceptionally well made. So how would one go about sifting through that mud? <laughs> That's a tough question. I mean, I'm a parent. So as a parent, I basically download game after game after game and I try all the free trials. And, you know, I do the free trials, but the first thing I do is sign up and then cancel it and then take a week to try the game. And if I feel like it's got a decent educational value, then I will actually pay and give it to my child. Uh, and if I don't, then I'm like, this is going in the trash pile, but I don't delete it. I keep it in a folder of, <laughs> that I actually call garbage on my I phone. Love it. So that I remember that I played this and it was bad. That's really funny. So yeah. you're like cross reference in the future. If you're like, did I play this one? Yes, because That's there are amazing. so many. Yeah, yeah, I mean, that, I mean, it was the inspiration for part of the name of the event, right? Like calling it the bad game arcade comes from that kind of perspective that a mm -hmm. lot of the games that I've come across are also quite poorly put together. Um, well, I mean, that's it for our time right now, but I'll get to chat with you more in the panel with everyone else later today. So thank you so much for being here and thank you for sharing with uh, me and whoever ends up listening to this. So I appreciate that. Um, yeah, is there anything else me. you wanted to add before we close? Uh, Ululab is open to working with researchers. So if anyone's interested in collaborating with us on you know, looking at how the game affects kids uh, uh, in sort of a research capacity, we are available. Fantastic. Well, if you're out there and you want to do that stuff, hit you up. Yeah, hit me up. I'm the marketing director. I'll put you in touch with everyone you need to talk to. Fantastic. Awesome. Thank you so much. And uh, for anyone who is in the Zoom call and they're listening, we're going to take a five minute break before our next talk. Um, so drink water, stretch your legs and live large. Thanks so much for being here. Thanks, Scott.